Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, John. Uh, this is actually a great way to kick us off on the main stage because you are in the, re the middle of remaking Sam's Club right now. So you came in about two years ago. For five years prior, th you know, a little underperformance. So, so start maybe by diagnosing the problem for us. What had gone wrong? Sure. Well, it's a great business and has been for a long time. Sam's Club has a 35-year legacy of serving members all over the country and several markets around the world. And we had been relatively flat for, for five years, as you said. So when I took the role back in the beginning of 2017, we had to step back and try to understand what had gotten us to this point where growth had slowed and we really had very little momentum in the top line of the business. And as we got a chance to get into the numbers, the, the interesting thing we found out is we had been operating under an assumption for quite some time that half the business was done with small businesses and the other half was transacted with our core consumer, like many of us who shop for your home. And the reason that, that number stayed out there is for years, once you signed up and you came in and you said, my name's Beth, I want to join, do you work in a small business or own one? If you said yes, we assigned you a card that was a business member card. And then other people got a consumer card. And then for the rest of the time you were a member with Sam's Club, we took every purchase that you ever made and we lumped it into small business. So we had to engage a project with machine learning early last year. Uh, someone on our team named Rolf in California led the project and unraveled all the transactions to help us understand what members were actually buying and what they were buying it for. And when so you, you took, didn't know this before? We didn't know this before. Okay. And we'd always assumed we were about 50-50. And what we learned is once you remove a couple of the businesses like fuel and the tobacco business, 85% of what was going out the door was going to someone's home. And 15% was going to a small business. And then there were some nuances within that to understand what they were buying, what they're using it for, and the way those transactions help or didn't help Sam's Club. And that led us to def defining the core member, who the shopper was that we were winning with, where we had the right to grow. And then we rationalized everything from real estate to the membership types, to the merchandise portfolio, to align the business to serve the core consumer, which is a suburban homeowner who... Yeah, who, who is this yeah, new... The core of, member. Yeah, who is this person? Yeah, and it's, it's not new. It's a big part of our, our core. And, and it is the small business customer, but it's a small business customer who is shopping for themselves. So this is a seventy-five dollars to $125,000 a year homeowner in the suburbs, typically has kids at home, a couple cars. And it's a great segment of the population because it's growing and we can grow with them. And the thing that we could do better, we think, than anyone to serve them with the right product and value and enable new ways of doing it. So one of the things you did do was close stores. And that, I, that is highly unusual for Walmart. I mean, in the company's history, that's not something you've done a lot. How did you convince everybody that this was the right thing to do? Well, if you go back in the company's history, even back into the 70s and 80s, you'll find we were in formats that we left. I remember in 1983, I lived in a little town, Fort Smith, Arkansas. Probably not many of you have been there. But I remember on the weekends, we would go to a Walmart store, and then we would go to a Helen's Craft Store. And Helen's Craft Store... I was going to say, what is... Was Hel Helen's Craft Store. Okay. It's named after Helen Walton, and it was an arts and craft format that was competing in that time in, in the fabric and craft section. And it's a format we exited. There was something called Bud's Wholesale that we exited. We've exited markets. So we do have a history of getting into businesses, and when they're either not core at work, we have had some times where we've exited businesses. And when we took the core consumer and then ran our real estate location's performance, and then the way that they were transacting, it was clear that a certain number of the clubs were not going to be successful by focusing in, and some of those clubs were a financial drain. Now, it's a tough decision to make, but it was a, the right decision because it enabled some of the investments that we've been able to make this year. So what did you end up doing with those stores? I mean, it's actually kind of interesting. You didn't just shut them down. Right, right. Some have... Uh, have begun operating as fulfillment centers. Um, we're, we're doing a great job. The first one was in Memphis, Tennessee, and we've got a number of the core items in the core assortment that we pick out of the facility and we ship for online orders. And we, we started that one. We've got several more that are underway now. And we started that at the time that we began offering free shipping for PLUS members. So one of the things we could invest in as a result of not having some of the businesses that weren't making money was the ability to invest in this free shipping proposition, and the results have been great. So we need more square footage, and we need more capacity to fulfill orders. So let's continue on this digital thread for a second. Mm -hmm. How has Amazon changed your business? Well, um, 
the way that we try to look at retail in general is to be proud of what we're doing. We're happy to have momentum, but it always helps to have a bit of a paranoia. So I try to think that. Operate, okay, lesson, operate with paranoia. That's like your MO in general. Yeah, I, <laughs> you, could, you could say that. But you've always got to be looking around the corner for what you don't see. And I think a lot of consumers are loyal in retail until there's something better. And once a consumer has something better, whether it be with you or someone else, they tend to switch. And so what we've been doing over the last couple of years is making sure that we are removing friction for members. Things like scan and go, two day delivery that's free with a plus membership. We're trying to do things to make sure that the consumer knows that we know who they are, which we do through the membership card, that we understand them, we relate to them, and then we can talk to them in a way that inspires them to do something because of the first three factors. Okay, okay. So w one thing that you've continued to do, even as you've moved up the ranks, and we'll talk about your history in a second, is that you continue to really spend time in the store about a day a week, is that oh, that's right? right? That's so right, that's right. What do you learn? Why do you do this, and what are some of the big takeaways? Well, I, I think th there, there are a couple ways that I, I try to stay close to the consumer that we serve each and every day. One of those is go to the, to the clubs at least once a week, whether I'm in town or somewhere around the country, I get in clubs a day a week. And it's just a way for me that helps me stay grounded, I stay close to the front line, I, I get a lot of great feedback. Um, there are things that I'm told that work a certain way in the home office that when you get to see them out in production. They're not exactly what you were told. They might be, but it's great to keep close to the projects and the work. And then the other way, we've got a net promoter system where members provide feedback post-shopping, and there's a screen in front of my desk, and all day long it runs someone's first name and what they had to say about the environment. And, and some of those are great, and some of those tell us we've got work to do. Can you give us an example of maybe something that you've seen there that then you've implemented? Sure, um, sure. One of, the, one of the, the most frequent comments we hear from members is you're out of something or you, moved, you move things around too much, um, which is actually true. Um, so we've taken a number of steps to stop moving merchandise and stop resetting the club, if you will. And a lot of these comments that where members say they're frustrated we didn't have something, we actually had it. We've just reset it and moved it around somewhere. So we've done quite a bit of work with analytics to get the, the right assortment. We call it a precision assortment project to make sure that the clubs are sorted the right way and that we're very consistent with the quality, the pricing, and then the location of product. Okay. So, so you are a big business in and of your own right, but you're within an even bigger business of Walmart. So mm -hmm. how, how do you really turn that ship? I mean, if you really want to make change, how do you, how have you changed the culture so that actually happens and people aren't sort of stuck in the way of doing things? Because you have been, I mean, you are the biggest company in, in the world. How, how do you get people to think differently? Well, you, you said something in, in the question that's important, and, and you have to focus on the way of working. Um, if you'd come in the office a couple of years ago, you would have seen a pretty traditional office environment, um, lots of offices, walls, nameplates, uh, you know, clear representation of the hierarchy of the business. You could tell who was running the office based on where they sat or where they parked. So we, we wanted to intentionally not only say things are going to be different, but provide some symbols to where people could recognize things are different. So we ripped the walls out, took the reserve parking away, we took the nameplates down, and then we resituated everyone in teams based on the consumer segment they serve. So if you'd come in a few years ago, you would have found the logistics department in one floor, tech somewhere else, the office supply team, the merchandise team somewhere else, replenishment somewhere else, and all those teams now sit together in an open, casual, fun environment. It's an inspiring environment. It's a fun place to work. And they're all there together solving member problems. And then the, the last thing, which I think is really important, we covered the office and merchandise. We are a product retailer. Our job is to narrow hundreds of thousands of choices down to the few that really matter, and so we're surrounded with product. So do you have an office? I have a chair. You have a chair, okay. I have a chair. That, well, that works. So t tell us a little more about the merchandising piece of it, because private label is a huge part of your business, and it sounds like there was a little bit of a switch in thinking there as well. Yeah, there was. We, we had, uh, over time, as I said, we had a really broad range of member segments, and we had as many as 16 member segments at one time. And coincidentally, coincidentally, I think we had about 16 different private labels at one time. So by focusing the target on the consumer down, we were able to quickly get to one brand, and that's the brand member's mark. And it's, it's a great brand. We built a strong team that's focused on quality and value. We only offer products in member's mark if we can do them as well or better than anyone else, and we have great values on those products. But it's been a core part of the business, and most weeks it's, it's a third of the units we sell. Okay, okay. 
Okay, so I want to talk about how you also keep, we talked about Walmart more broadly, but how you keep yourself fresh with new ideas. I mean, you've been around the company since you were three years three. old. That's right, that's right. And you're a lifer. So how do you right. make sure that you're not stuck? Well, I, I did st start unofficially at the age of three. My, my father worked with the company, and my Saturdays were sometimes hanging out in the toy department at a Walmart store back in the 70s. And I was sure that I wasn't going to work for the company because clearly no one wants to do what their parents did. Um, but I joined, uh, joined in college and just had a great time. I actually realized quickly in this, in this job but that... First, tell everybody what you, what you thought you were going to be. Well, I... I uh, I have a share of, of rock, a love of rock music, like a person Phil here in the audience, uh, but I was completely determined to be in a rock band. I played guitar uh, from the time I was 13 or 14, and I was, I was set on being the next Slash in Guns N' Roses. Um, clearly, I didn't have the hair for it, uh, potentially not even the chops, but, but I, was, I was sure I was going to make it as a musician. That, that wasn't working out, um, didn't pay well when you don't get gigs. And it, it resulted in joining at a Walmart store. And then, and then I just fell in love with it. So yeah, so tell, sorry, tell us then how, what do you do kind of aside from work or even when you're in the office, do you try to talk with people from different departments? Are you talking to the international team? How do you stay unstuck? Yeah, I say, well, a number, a number of ways. Um, I, I can't sit still. I don't sit in the chair much. So if you do find where I sit, it's usually an empty chair. If I get a free minute, I'm running through the halls talking to people. I'm just curious by nature. Um, I'm spending the rest of the week this week with our e-com team in California. And, and, and look, the world's changing. We have to change. And if we're not changing, we'll stop. The, the world will move ahead of us, and the business could get stuck if we decide not to change. So we're not reinventing who we are all the time. We're very principled. We believe in respect. We believe in service. We have a place of high regard and integrity. Those things won't change, and those will never change. Uh, I think in a few years, if, if the technology platforms we're building change the way we operate, you're still going to be able to, in some way, shop with Sam's Club and find great quality products that are based on the principles I just, just, just talked about. So there's important to stay centered, but, but look, everything that comes up that's new and different is an opportunity for us to connect dots and try to do something in a way for a consumer that hasn't been done before. I'm going to go to questions in one second, but first, I, you, know, you spent time in China. I did. And tell us, are there lessons that you learned there that you've brought back to the business here in the US? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. And I was, I was fortunate enough to spend three years in China. And not only was I fortunate to spend three years in China, I think I got the right three years. I started in China January 2013. And my first impressions were it was a stable consumer environment, yes, high growth, um, but was pretty manual by nature. There wasn't uh, just a tremendous of e-commerce at that time. It was in place and growing. But over the three years, um, we saw the launch of the thing, you know, like the Red Pocket by Tencent, and then mobile wallet started appearing. And I, I, first, I remember in the first few weeks, I, I just decided I was going to spend a lot of time at ATM machines because the country ran on cash. Everywhere you went, people wanted cash, and it was always pockets full of 100 RMB bills. And I didn't know if that would change at the rate it was going to. Well, when I left in 2015, clearly you could sense quite a bit of change with the consumer. Well, fast forward to late 16, I went back for a visit. And I was walking down the street, and someone that was, was uh, in, in need was asking for money. And someone in the crowd in Chinese told this individual that we didn't have any cash. And, and then he proceeded to hold up a smartphone and said, just put it on my WeChat account. <laughs> So it was at that point, it hit me how much change had happened in sh such a short amount of time. But if you've ever worked in, as, or lived as an expat, it's, it's one of the rare times in your career you know you have a start date and you have an end date. And so it's almost this artificial deadline. You know you have to do things because you're going to be leaving and going somewhere else, and you've got to leave the team in better shape than what, it, than what was in when you got there. So when I took this role, I just, I just put on myself a three-year deadline. The following things have to happen in three years, or I can assume that I wouldn't get the chance to fix those. So it, it was really helpful for me to see the work in a different way, to be there when China was really digitizing, and it's at a pace that I don't think any of, of us have ever seen before. But it was quite an inspiring time to be in China. So you're still operating like an expat? I'm still operating like an expat. I just assumed that, that, that Max, if I got three years in this role, what would I do? And hopefully it's longer than that, and certainly we intend for it to be. But um, if you think of it that way, it just forces you to speed up. Because if we don't speed up, someone will speed up for us. And then that member who's loyal as long as there's not something better may walk away from us. Do we have any questions in the audience? No. 
Okay. Well, let me ask you a follow-up about China. Mm -hmm. Retail is moving so quickly there. What does what's happening in that market tell you about the future of retail here in the U.S.? Well, it, it, it informs how connected consumers are and can be as long as the technology allows for it. There's so many connections in China that you could imagine happening in other markets. It's inspiring to keep up with, but also they just they can develop in a way that's faster than most parts of the world because they didn't develop on mainframes. So speaking to someone earlier that we talked about how we're on mainframe systems and we're trying to develop new technology, mobile technology to get off the mainframes, they're not having to get off it because they never developed for it. Okay. So they're able to put all their resources into the mobile development environment. Okay. What is, um, do we have a question? Oh, we've got two questions up here. If we could just wait for the mic to get up here. And if you could just introduce yourself, thanks. Sure, so I'm uh, Kamal Alawalia from Eightfold. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the changing demographics and the fact that millennials do shop differently? And where do you see Sam's Club shaping up there? Because I do know that at least in Silicon Valley, Walmart Labs is not the most sought after brand from an employment standpoint. Mm -hmm. But let's leave that aside. How do you look at millennials as a growing demographic? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it, like I was saying earlier, one of the inspiring factors changing the way we worked was to make sure that we were relevant as an employer and an exciting place to work for millennials. So when we went through this, this work stream to decide how we were going to work, I, I was thinking about, I've got a number of, of kids at home who are in college, one's in college, and several not. I wanted to make sure that this is a place that I thought they would love to work in once they saw and got to experience the environment. Um, as far as shopping, um, it's an exciting group, and it's not just a few years until it's just a few years until millennials are the biggest spending group in the country, and we're we're looking forward to that. Uh, they're very purpose driven. They love recipes. They love to know what's inside. They love to know the story that exists behind a brand. So when we think of of categories in in the members mark brand, like in the meat department or in dry grocery, we are hyper focused on the recipe, what goes into it. Because when you see millennial shop, it's not just about what's in the front. They read the back. They want to know the rest of the story. They use their smartphone to learn more about the product. So it's important that we think of the entire experience from employment to product to practices all the way across to attract millennials. Great. Uh, John, just to end, tell us what does Sam's Club look like in five years? You're playing off that question. What do you, what's going to be the thing that is the most different? Well, as I said earlier, we're, we're going to continue to focus on great products and great values. That's what we do. I think the difference in us in a few years is we'll be enabled by technology for associates and for consumers, and we want to connect all the dots. We're, we're a brand that believes that the integrated experience between shopping online and shopping in a club should be completely seamless, and we've got a great team of engineers who are working on bringing all the pieces together. Great. John, thank you so sure. much for joining thank you. us. Thank you.